Our first speaker is Jennifer Babcock, and our second speaker, and I, I won't, in order to compress, is Andrew Farnell Ward, again from the IFA. So, Jennifer. Okay, um, good morning. Uh, before I begin, I would like to take the time to thank the NYU Center for Ancient Studies, the Department of Classics, and the Animal Studies Initiative for co-sponsoring this conference. I'd also like to thank Maura Pollard for all of her hard work in organizing the speakers and helping with our AV needs. And uh, finally, to Professor Ann Roth for all of her guidance um, in my dissertation and in the work that I'm presenting to you today. <clears throat> The ancient Egyptian view of the animal world contained a duality. On the one hand, animals posed a threat to the ancient Egyptians and were perceived as dangerous manifestations of disorder and wildness. However, they were also seen as useful creatures that could be controlled and ordered. Indeed, they played a major part of the ancient Egyptian religion, often being a part of the pantheon of gods and having major roles in Egyptian mythology. As a result, ancient Egyptian art is teeming with animal life, though how animals are represented varies considerably depending on what concepts the ancient Egyptians wanted to express. I am particularly interested in the depiction of anthropomorphized animals, which are found in a number of art historical contexts in ancient Egypt, but I am primarily concerned with the representation on New Kingdom ostraca and papyri because of what they might be able to tell us about ancient Egyptian aesthetic value and visual narrative construction. However, before I discuss this specific topic, I think it is important to explain in greater detail how animals were generally represented and understood in ancient Egypt. Depictions of animals in daily life settings are most commonly found in ancient Egyptian tombs, particularly Old Kingdom mastabas and the rock hut tombs of the New Kingdom. All of the animals depicted in these scenes are accurately rendered and accurately model animal behaviors. Linda Evans's dissertation about animal behavior in ancient Egyptian art, for instance, demonstrates how depictions of animals match the behaviors of animals that she has observed in zoos and in the wild. In the tomb reliefs, she is able to identify representations of animals in the process of preening, being led against their will, and nursing, to name some of the behaviors. Furthermore, she and numerous other scholars have shown that the ancient Egyptians carefully rendered their animals so that their species and types could be easily identifiable. This is true even in ancient Egyptian hieroglyphs in which a variety of bird signs, for instance, can be linked to actual birds that still exist in Egypt today. Clearly then, it was important to the ancient Egyptians to depict animals as recognizably as possible, both in terms of appearance and behavior. By doing so, these images provide an insightful view of what daily life in ancient Egypt may have looked like, though they may have also had a deeper symbolic meaning as well. I mentioned earlier that animals in ancient Egypt represented elements of both order and control and also of chaos. Duality, especially the duality of chaos and order, is an important fundamental concept of ancient Egyptian religion and worldview. For the ancient Egyptians, order cannot exist without chaos, and vice versa, and maintaining the balance between the two is an important aspect of ancient Egyptian life. Thus, there are two elements of the animal world that are often displayed in ancient Egyptian tomb chapels. The first shows domesticated animals, the ordered world, in which humans control and use animals for their benefit, such as agricultural and food production. Other scenes show animals in the wild, their natural habitat, or the chaotic world, where there are potential dangers. The tomb of Meriteti, which I'm showing here, happens to show both on the same wall. The animals on the left side of the image show animals in the wild, in which dog, dogs are hunting down cap roots. As a way to reflect the chaos inherent in nature, the animals are arranged in a jumble, whereas on the right half of the image, the domesticated animals are shown being led in an orderly fashion. In some cases, such as in fishing and fowling scenes, the tomb owner is shown taking control over nature and upholding order. These fishing and fowling motifs may have been considered to be apotropaic because of this, and are usually depicted in the doorways of tomb chambers as a way to protect the space from chaotic forces from entering. 
The ancient Egyptians also saw certain animal behaviors that seemed to fit within their cosmology quite well, which is another reason for their importance in the culture. Representations of hedgehogs, for instance, were used as amulets because of their associations with death and rebirth, which was a result of their hibernation. They were also admired for their resilience in the semi-desert areas outside of the floodplain. Similarly, there are numerous faience hippo statuettes and amulets that clearly had magical properties to the ancient Egyptians. They had apotropaic purposes, warding off the attentions of the hippopotamus, an incredibly dangerous and volatile animal. It is particularly interesting that many of the statuettes of hippopotami were ritually broken at the legs, rendering the potentially violent animal vulnerable as a way to ensure that it would not cause harm to the person benefiting from its protective qualities. Additionally, hippopotami were connected with concepts of regeneration since they lived in the renewing waters of the Nile and also because they were believed to make a noisy roar during dawn and dusk, thus linking itself with the sun's passage and symbolism of death and rebirth. Even insects were important in ancient Egyptian culture. For instance, there is one species of dung beetle in Egypt that collects dung into a ball, which it then rolls to a location where it ultimately crawls inside to hide and lay eggs, from which larvae and new beetles are born. To the ancient Egyptians, the process of the beetle crawling into a ball of dung, followed by eggs hatching out of the dung, looked like rebirth, an important concept in the ancient Egyptian religion. When the beetle rolled the ball of dung across the desert sand, the Egyptians imagined it as the solar god Kepri pushing the sun across the sky. Thus, in many representations of the sun, one sees images of a winged scarab holding a sun disk. Furthermore, the god Kepri is often represented as a beetle or as a human with, the be with a beetle serving as its head. These types of animal-headed gods are perhaps one of the most recognizable and characteristic aspects of ancient Egyptian culture. Various gods and goddesses are shown fully or partially as animals in order to benefit from the qualities of that animal because the behaviors of certain, of certain animals reminded them of various aspects in their cosmology. It is presumed, for instance, that Anubis, the ancient Egyptian god of mummification and the afterlife, has the head of a jackal because jackals are associated with cemeteries due to the fact that many lived out in the desert to scavenge for dead bodies. Clearly, animals had a prominent role in ancient Egyptian culture. The ancient Egyptians seem to have carefully observed the natural behaviors of the domesticated and wild animals that existed in their day-to-day -day life and found ways to incorporate them in their cosmology and material culture. There is one type of animal imagery, however, that remains baffling to many Egyptologists, which are the images of anthropomorphized animals found in New Kingdom papyri and ostraca. Unlike most of the representation of animals in tomb settings, these animals behave in very unnatural ways and at times are shown with behaviors that are opposite to what is seen in nature. Before I continue, I must clarify what an ostracon is in the field of Egyptology, since it differs from how classicists understand the word. Egyptologists refer to any pot shirt or broken piece of limestone with writing or drawings on it as an ostracon. Ostraca with writing are called textual ostraca and can include administrative records, judiciary reports, private letters, literature, laundry lists, among many other things. Ostraca with drawings are called figured ostraca and can include sketches, drawings used for apprenticeship, and blueprints for architectural work. In essence, ostraca in the Egypto Egyptological framework have a multitude of purposes and can in fact be considered the ancient Egyptian equivalent to a modern notepad, though I do want to stress that the availability of the ostraca as a material does not lessen the value of the written and drawn material on them. As we see from the images of anthropomorphized animals on the figured ostraca, it is clear that they were used as a quote-unquote canvas for well-drawn works of art, and I believe it is likely that the ancient Egyptians themselves highly valued many of these drawings on an aesthetic level. The drawings of anthropomorphized animals are found on about 79 ostraca, of which I am aware, and three papyri currently housed in museums in Turin, London, and Cairo. Although the ostraca and papyri are improvenanced objects, it is generally assumed that they were drawn by, by the artists from a town called Dar al-Medina, 
which housed the artists and workmen who excavated, constructed, and decorated the royal tombs in the Valley of the Kings and the Valley of the Queens. This is primarily due to the fact that they are most likely from the Theban region, and because the drawings on the papyri and many of the ostraca demonstrate a high level of skill expected from artists working on the royal tombs. The drawings depict animals who are often standing upright and who are sometimes dressed in ancient Egyptian clothing. These images can be grouped into various motifs, which are at times repeated in other ostraca and in the papyri. For instance, the most common motif is the image of a seated elite mouse being served by a cat. Egyptologists have widely noted the humorous use of role reversal in this particular motif in which predator serves prey, and have argued that the images of anthropomorphized animals, therefore, represent social satire. However, satire, and this is actually the dictionary definition, uses ridicule, irony, and sarcasm for the purpose of exposing vice and folly. The interpretation that the images of anthropomorphized animals are satirical overlooks two points. For one, it is unlikely that people working on the royal tombs and also many elite tombs in the Theban desert, would want to openly mock their source of income. Secondly, it is likely that the artists at Dera Medina considered themselves to be elite members of ancient Egyptian society, making it implausible that political socioeconomic satire was the driving force behind the imagery. This is not to say that the images were not considered to be humorous. Rather, I think it is more accurate to understand them as parody, images that use and mimic elite imagery to fabricate meanings and stories that are not negatively charged. Dero Medina, the town from which these ostraca and papyri are believed to come, was a rare community whose inhabitants were more sophisticated and financially well off than the overall ancient Egyptian population. Workers in the community enjoyed a generous monthly wage from the state and many could afford their own tools, which were significantly better than those provided by the government. The population was also highly literate, and most of the population consisted of highly skilled inhabitants, such as artists and scribes, who benefited from specialized formal education. Compared to the majority of the Egyptian population, who were mostly uneducated and unskilled, the artists at Dero Medina would have likely believed that they belonged to a sophisticated elite class. This becomes increasingly clear in their artistic expression. Aesthetically, the tombs at Dero Medina are stunning, a quality to be expected from a cemetery attached to a village whose inhabitants were responsible for excavating and decorating the royal tombs. And when one looks at the motifs used in the tomb chambers and how the artists chose to depict themselves, it is increasingly clear that they considered themselves to be part of the new kingdom of the, of the elite New Kingdom Egyptian society. A prime example of this is Senegem's tomb shown here, the first tomb to be discovered in the cemetery at Dero Medina. Senegem held the title Servant in the Place of Truth, which meant that he worked on the excavation and decoration of the royal tombs. His tomb is one of the most beautiful in Dero Medina cemetery, and the paintings in it show that Senegem considered himself and his family to be part of the ancient Egyptian elite class. Senegem is depicted with his wife wearing fine linen clothing, garments associated with elite New Kingdom Egyptians, while they're shown doing tasks in which elites in other tombs are engaged. These activities include effortless art agricultural work in the netherworld field of Iaru, being seated before rich tables of offerings, and praying to the gods. Other tombs in Dero Medina Cemetery belonging to the artists and workmen of the royal tombs include the same elite funerary imagery. Although the quality of the paintings varies, they are all competently done. Furthermore, the fact that these tombs are richly decorated and also usually included funerary goods and furniture attests to the fact that the families to whom these tombs belonged would be considered to be part of the elite class. The level of craftsmanship used in many of the Dero Medina tombs was the same as what is seen in other high elite tombs, and clearly the artists were conversant with and had a sophisticated knowledge of the aesthetic practices of the high ancient Egyptian elite class. The intimate familiarity that the artists at Dero Medina had with the themes and motifs found in other elite tombs at Thebes is reflected not only in their own tombs, 
but also in the imagery depicting anthropomorphized animals. For instance, the motif of a seated elite mouse being waited on by a cat servant seems to refer to the numerous funerary depictions of seated tomb owners being waited on by servants. Likewise, there are numerous depictions of animal musicians in Ostraca and in the papyri from the Turin and the British museums, which relate closely to the musicians and the banqueting scenes found in many New Kingdom Theban tombs. The pastoral scenes found on the Ostraca, as well as in the papyri, currently in Turin, London, and Cairo, also relate to pastoral scenes that are commonly found in elite tombs. The Ostracon shown here, for instance, depicts a cat herding a flock of birds, which directly relates to the scene in Nebumun's tomb in which a man is shown engaged in the same activity. Of particular interest is one ostracon from the Institut Francais d'Archéologie Orientale, Cairo, that includes three animal musicians. The caprid in the center of the image is of particular interest because its head is depicted frontally rather than in profile, which is not the canonical way of depicting human and animal heads in ancient Egyptian art. The subject matter and the full frontal representation of the animal recalls the banqueting scene in Nebumun's Theban tomb chapel, in which there are two female musicians whose faces are also depicted facing forward. Because of the similarity in subject matter and representation, one may conjecture that the artist of this particular ostracon was familiar with the decoration in Nebumun's tomb chapel, though of course this cannot be proven conclusively. Nonetheless, the similarities between this particular ostracon and the banqueting scene in Nebumun's tomb indicate a close relationship between the imagery seen in the images of anthropomorphized animals and elite mortuary art. The other problem with interpreting the images of anthropomorphized animals as being political or socioeconomic satire is that there are some instances where there is no apparent role reversal. For instance, the animal musicians and the depictions of animals playing board games do not indicate any kind of role reversal that would necessarily suggest social satire. Furthermore, other images, such as the one of the hippopotamus in the tree and the crow climbing a ladder, which is featured on one ostracon and serves as a vignette on the Turin papyrus, does not follow the same predator-prey interaction that one sees in the ostraca and papyri depicting elite mice and cat servants. The meaning behind the image of the hippopotamus and the crow remains a mystery, though it is interesting to note that such an unusual vignette appears on both an ostracon and a papyrus, albeit only in these two instances. The relationship between the ostraca and the papyri should also be addressed. If one compares the vignettes that are represented on the ostraca with the papyri, the similarities are evident. In some cases, it seems as though one could lay out various ostraca in a particular order to match the sequence drawn on the papyri. While one may think that the ostraca served as a draft for the papyri, this does not appear to be the case, at least to me. There is only one ostracon that seems to match a vignette and one of the papyri exactly in terms of style and content. An ostracon from the Medelhofs Museet in Stockholm depicts a cat shepherding a flock of birds while carrying a bird in one of its paws and a staff in the other. The birds are organized in two rows, one on top of the other, directly in front of the cat. The same configuration is also seen in one of the vignettes featured in the British Museum papyrus. There is no other cat shepherding scene like this in which a cat holding a crook and a bird stands behind two rows of birds and any other papyri or ostraca I have seen. Stylistically, one can see many similarities as well. Both cats have wide circular eyes, with a pupil located directly in the center of the eye, giving them a somewhat, but probably unintentional, shocked expression. The ears of the cats are also tall, pointy, and upright, and the silhouettes of the cats continue in an unbroken line to articulate the ear in the foreground, so that the other ear seems to be further back in space. The articulation of the fur in both ostracon and papyrus is also similar, in which the artists use short black lines to indicate stripes in the pattern of the fur. Indeed, the style and similar composition of the Stockholm ostracon and the vignette in the British Museum may indicate that the same artist was responsible for both. However, even if one does not want to jump to the conclusion that these two images are done by the same artist, 
I think it is apparent, nonetheless, that one artist was aware of the other's work. However, I would like to reiterate that the ostraca do not seem to have been used as drafts for the papyri. Given the care and attention that appears to have been lavished on the ostraca drawings, it seems unlikely that they were considered to be trial sketches. Rather, it seems more likely that they were valued as works of art independent of the papyrus drawings. The use of a stock set of characters and motifs in these images of anthropomorphized animals and in the papyri, in the papyri and the ostraca also strongly suggests they may refer to a narrative that is no longer available to modern scholars. Indeed, the close similarity between the vignettes on the papyri and the drawn images on the ostraca proposes the possibility that a specific visual assemblage was intended or that the ostraca might have been laid out in a particular order similar to the organization of the papyri. Emma Brunner Trout and Diane Flores, two Egyptologists, have noted Notice that at least the ostraca from Berlin and Boston museums may refer to the legend of Tefnut, in which the goddess Tefnut runs away from Egypt in the form of a cat, while the god Thoth, who is transformed into a baboon, is sent to bring her back home. Similar and related iconography in other ostraca, such as the one from the Metz collection, may also be related to the aforementioned folktale. On several different ostraca from various museum collections, there are images of birds' nests or cats carrying a bird's nest, as well as images of cats interacting with baboons. In the legend of Tefnut, Thoth tells Tefnut the story of a vulture and a cat who make an oath to not harm each other's young while the other is away. It seems likely that the ostraca depicting birds' nests and cats carrying these nests represent different sequences from the Tefnut legend. There's another set of ostraca that also seem to refer to some kind of narrative. The ostraca, which are currently located in separate collections in Stockholm, Chicago, and Cairo, involve three characters, a young boy, a cat, and an elite mouse. In the Chicago ostracon, the cat whips the boy while the elite mouse supervises the scene. The situation is reversed in the Cairo Ostracon, in which the boy whips the cat while the mouse stands to the right and watches. In the Stockholm Ostracon, both the cat and the mouse whip the boy. These drawings are different in terms of artistic style, which suggests that they were drawn by three different artists. One cannot know if they were drawn at the same time, but they all seem to reference the same story. It seems as if the ostraca illustrate three different moments in a narrative that is now lost. This kind of whipping or spanking scenario has some prece precedence in ancient Egyptian visual culture. In Anne Roth's study of some of the Old Kingdom Giza mastabas, she notes two different spanking reliefs in which a young youth is being hit with a stick while an overseer wearing a starched kilt observes. Although the motif is not particularly common, the theme seems to have persisted for a long time in ancient Egypt. Another possible reference to the imagery shown in the three ostraca are the Ramesside scribal papyri and ostraca that talk about the punishment of lazy, idle students. In the papyrus Lansing, a teacher writes to an unwilling pupil and says, quote, but though I beat you with every kind of stick, you do not listen. If I knew another way of doing it, I would do it for you that you might listen, end quote. Similarly, in advice to the youthful scribe, quote, do not spend a day of idleness or you shall be beaten. The youth has a back and he hearkens to the beating of him, end quote. Thus, in the case of the three ostraca, it is possible that the artists were drawing from long-standing, albeit rare, elite imagery, or were referencing contemporaneous papyri and scribal learning, with which the artists from Dero Medina may have been quite familiar. Regardless, the fact that they are referencing either shows that the artists were either well acquainted and educated with older elite artistic themes or had the sophistication to visually interpret written documents about scribal education. Of course, the two are not mutually exclusive and both hypotheses as to the inspiration of these three ostraca demonstrate the cultivation of the artists producing these images of anthropomorphized animals. The papyri, in a way, are more difficult to decipher because Egyptologists tend to only recognize visual narratives in Egyptian art as a sequence of images. However, when we attempt to read the images side by side in these papyri, there does not seem to be any indication of cause and effect, 
and the motifs seem to be randomly organized along their register. I think it may be possible that these papyrus images were not intended to be a continuous narrative in which there's a sequence of images that represent the passage of time. Rather, I think it is more likely that each motif represents its own story that an ancient Egyptian would immediately recognize and be able to recall, much as ancient Greeks would recognize and recall narratives in the vignettes depicted on their pottery. After all, ancient Egyptian literature includes numerous, <clears throat> numerous stories about anthropomorphized animals, and interestingly, most are told using a frame narrative. For instance, the legend of Tefnut is a frame narrative in which the overarching story is Thoth telling Tefnut stories in order to lure her back home. There are other stories that he told her, Thoth told Tefnut, other than the one about the cat and the bird, and I think it is possible that the images on the papyri and the ostraca may be an illustrated record of some of them. Though the exact meaning behind the iconography of these anthropomorphized animals is still unclear, it helps to realize that the artists who made them were sophisticated and considered themselves to be part of the elite class. Knowing this, one can agree that these images were not intended to be political or socioeconomic satire. Furthermore, one can draw the conclusion that the imagery on both the anthropomorphizing ostraca and papyri may have been conceptualized as skillful works of art, which is demonstrated not only through the artistic skill that is evident in the drawings, but also because of the fact that the artists making these drawings had a nuanced and clear understanding of the paintings and reliefs found in the elite and also royal monuments. Why the ancient Egyptians chose to represent human activities being carried out by animals is a mystery, but given that these animals are acting contrary to their nature, I think it is clear that they were intended to be humorous and fundamentally different in their purpose and meaning than other representations of animals in ancient Egypt. Thank you.